thanks for joining everyone. Um, my name's Sally Williamson. Um, I'm um, the co-chair of the Australian Water Association's um, Water Quality Monitoring, Monitoring and Analysis Specialist Network Committee. And um, on behalf of the committee today, um, we've got a presentation from David Austin, who is um, a uh, the global practice lead and senior principal technologist for natural treatment systems at Jacob. Um, he's an environmental engineer and senior ecologist based in St. Paul, Minnesota. He has 22 years of national and international design and technology development experience with natural treatment systems, reservoir management, mine reclamation, and decentralized wastewater treatment. Um, and today he's going to be talking to us about um, hypolimnetic oxygenation to improve reservoir water quality. Um, yeah, so just a uh, bit of housekeeping, um, just to let you know that today's presentation will be um, recorded. Um, and um, there will be plenty of time at the end for um, Q&A, but um, if David happens to run out of time um, to answer your questions, um, we can definitely follow up afterwards. So. Um, just have a look, it looks like people at Hunter Water are still trying to join. Do we want to wait or are we happy to proceed? Something. Yep, cool, all good. I think David, are you there? I can hand over to you now. Uh, I'm, yes. I'm here, can you hear me? Are you well, yes. Do you well? Do you hear me well? Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for, for attending. As uh, Sally said, I'll be talking about hypolimetic oxygenation to improve reservoir water. Actually, the first picture that you see here on the title slide is of the deployment of a linear diffuser uh, pure oxygen system that you see are the ballast pipes that float the whole system. You can see the, the weights that uh, will ultimately allow this to be sunk to the bottom. So this is being towed out to be put over the beach of stone in a reservoir and it will soon be sunk. So let's, let's move on. Well, the agenda will have some background, some technical background, uh, a lot on internal loading of nutrients and metals, which is why we do this in the first place. To describing the technologies that are available to do this, uh, some case studies. I'll do most of the technical work on the first case study, and then there are a couple of case studies that follow to show a similar pattern, and then come up with some conclusions. And what you see here in this picture is the manufacture of a linear diffuser system at Lakeside. These are button welded HPPE. They have fittings. Uh, you can see these hoses. These are soaker hoses that are act the actual diffuser section themselves. Black pipe is the, uh, the supply pipe. And these can be manufactured by the kilometer at the side of the lake or reservoir. So let's first look at internal nutrient loading. There's a few technical uh, issues or there's some technical ground to cover here. And I'll repeat myself just a little bit to make uh, to emphasize some points. So anoxic release of nutrients and metals from the sediments is uh, a common phenomenon, it's a worldwide geochemical phenomenon. It tends to be massively nonlinear. That is to say, there are positive feedback effects. Most of our models, really all of them to my knowledge, uh, tend not to have these feedbacks and they then tend to miss how these events can spin up. It favors cyanobacteria, biology, and ecology. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And also the release of iron is a known trigger for cyanobacteria blooms. And more of that in a bit. Warm weather dominance or bloom tipping point of internal loading is often overlooked in water quality models. Um, of course, warm, warm water is a known uh, risk factor for cyanobacteria blooms. But these positive feedbacks allow cyanobacteria blooms to ramp up very quickly. And really, the whole point in many ways of oxygenation is to just prevent these uh, ramp ups to squelch or quench these positive feedback effects. 
So here's an example of nonlinear uh, internal nutrient loading. This graph's got a lot going on, but we can pull it apart. The horizontal scale is redox in millivolts. It's the standard hydrogen electron electrode scale that uh, this is the lower calibration point if anyone uh, works with this. On the right hand axis is that manganese in micrograms per liter, and on the left hand axis we've got iron and orthophosphate in uh, micrograms per liter. So redox is a boring and useless parameter when there's plenty of oxygen around. It doesn't really tell us much of anything, unless of course you're doing something odd like uh, an ozone reactor and you're dealing with high redox numbers, but uh, we won't be doing that of course in a lake. But a lot of the uh, protocols that we that we use in, in this lake is because it will vary by protocol. Uh, it's at about plus 300, 375 millivolts, the oxygen is gone in this lake. It is a bit of a lag, and we start getting the uh, the release of nutrients. And as you can see, this is this follows the power function: iron, manganese then we start getting a moderate hydrogen sulfide odor and then a strong hydrogen sulfide odor. And with that strong hydrogen sulfide odor, we pretty much uh, hit an asymptote on the positive feedback. And so there's actually terminology for this. To be precise, it's hypoxia when the oxygen is low or you know, just at zero. Anoxia once we start getting a reduction of iron and manganese. And uh, the, the, the oceanography literature actually has another term we seldom use in windology, and that's neutrino, when there's strong hydrogen sulfide presence. And I'm starting to use that because it is really a category that's identifiable and, and very important. So hypomimetic oxygenation is designed to kill all of these things, but it sort of kills them in reverse order if you're starting off with this sort of situation. It kills the hydrogen sulfide, it oxidizes the manganese and iron, and then it, then it proceeds into uh, killing hypoxia by providing a, a positive dissolved oxygen. Now, in this next graph, this is taken, these are data taken at the same time. This is uh, sulfate. Now, really, it's all about sulfate reduction. It's the positive feedback and sulfate. So we've got the uh, positive feedback with the with the solutes on the previous slide, but this is the negative feedback. It's the mirror image of this as sulfate is being driven down. The scale here is the micrograms per liter, so there's not a lot of sulfate here. There's not a, a, a high sulfate system, yet it's enough at about three milligrams per liter to be able to power this kind of positive feedback. Now, there are in Australia some waters with, with extremely low sulfate. Uh, particularly around Sydney, tend to escape this sort of phenomenon. It doesn't go to Euxinia. It uh, reservoirs will stop at anoxia because there's not enough sulfate to really drive it much beyond uh, the, the, the anoxic phases in manganese and iron reduction. But it doesn't take much to go a long way. And I also thought that it, it would be good to include an exponential time scale. Again, data from this same particular lake because it was very stably thermally stratified until we got clean data to be able to show these underlying biogeochemical uh, forces at play. So I pulled the iron from the previous slide, put it into a time scale, but then I also included ammonia. I put these two together because they're important nutrients to think about. Of course, phosphorus is of paramount importance. But when we're looking at cyanobacteria, actually iron is, um, uh, is, is a, a macronutrient for cyanobacteria, not for the rest of the, you know, the true algae, the eukaryotes, but, but cyanobacteria need iron uh, in very high quantities compared to the to, to true, true algae. And also release of ammonium from sediments is a ion exchange phenomenon. That is to say, as iron is reduced from uh, plus three oxidation state to plus two, it becomes soluble. And then that uh, iron, that ferrous iron, displaces 
ammonium, which is loosely bound to organic matter in sediments. So there's, it's, there's a knock-on effect, and this is especially important for some type sorts of cyanobacteria blooms. And in particular, it would be uh, for microcystis, which really needs ammonia to, to ramp up. Well, the goal of uh, the geochemical goal of oxygenation is somewhat simple. I mean, it can be stated simply, it's not simple scientifically, but what we're looking at here, you see some sediment forms. So, oxygen is injected in the deep water above the sediment to create a ferric iron tap to entomb phosphorus and hydrogen sulfide and a few other things. Uh, in the sediments. And really, from a strictly geochemical perspective, it can be viewed in this way. The whole purpose of oxygen is to keep the ferric iron ferric on the top of the sediments, and that ferric iron then reacts with what's below. So, for instance, the reaction rate of, of iron with hydrogen sulfide are, are maybe 10 times, and it's supposed to go 100 times faster than just that straight oxidation of hydrogen sulfide. So, it isn't, in effect, a permeable reactive barrier placed on the sediment surface. There's a lot more to it than that in the overall dynamics of, of the lake, but this, this is critical. This is what has to happen to control nutrients. So you have to ask yourself the question, what if there's enough iron? It's not always true there's enough iron to be able to uh, find the sulfate, or excuse me, find the phosphate in, in the water. And there is strong scientific criticism in the scientific literature Stating oxygen is not enough, that paradigm is, is deficient. And, there, and that's true. It, it bothers some people in the field, but in fact, it's true. There, there has to be enough iron to find the phosphate for oxygenation uh, to work. And also, as we shall see later on in this presentation, turbulence over sediments must be low. This is, this is extremely important, and it's uh, much overlooked factor in reservoir remediation. And I'll show you some examples of how important that can be in a bit. And we have a problem in high sulfide environments if a, if a lake or reservoir has been eucinic or highly toxic for a long time. The iron that had been there, that had is scavenged and gets bound up in ferrous sulfide and even in pyrite. So, in a sense, the iron cycle is, is uh, destroyed uh, or held toxic. I'm not sure what the analogy would be there, but it doesn't work. So, sometimes we put the iron back along with the oxygen. In fact, we most commonly do that, but sometimes it's not necessary, so, so we don't. And to do that, we commonly inject ferric chloride with injection steam targets significantly below half a milligram per liter, uh, enough. Really, you, you keep it lower than about 0.3 milligrams per liter. Obviously, you, you have an opportunity to change the setting of your dosing pump, so you can dial that into what you need to be. Well, there's a special consideration of cyanobacteria, and one of the reasons that hydrolymetic oxygenation is so effective at, uh, at, at uh, really reducing, sharply reducing the incidence of cyanobacteria blooms. And, and, and that's because sediment anoxia is critical to most cyanobacteria blooms. Not all. Uh, cyanobacteria blooms are a complex phenomenon, but one of the central drivers of cyanobacteria blooms is sediment anoxia. And, and it can be a bit of a sleeper, even in a very shallow, big sluggish river, you can have stratification and anoxia at the sediment surface, and that, that's very helpful helpful to uh, drive cyanobacteria blooms. And the reason is cyanobacteria move up and down in the water column daily. These are data from a reservoir in Florida, uh, continuous vertical profile monitoring. I drew uh, an averaging line through the, through all the docks, but this is just the, the surface reading of phycocyanin, which is uh, recorded as RFU, the reference chromosome unit uh, which is the calibration dye, but typically how we, we measure this. It's a lot of work to get it calibrated to self or uh, ML, but you can do that. 
but but it shows that it's moving up and down in the water column quite quite nicely on a, a diurnal cycle. And they're, the cyanobacteria bacteria are, are moving down and, and getting their nutrients. So they're making carbohydrates, their granules and the like, which makes them denser and they're thin. They get nutrients from the deep, from the carbohydrates, store the carbon dioxide bubbles in special vesicles that make them buoyant, uh, and up they go. And, th and these sinking and rising rates can be really quite uh, amazingly uh, large. So about 50 centimeters per hour is not uncommon. I've seen I've seen uh, much higher numbers in the literature. So I'm sure there's a number of factors at play, but that does mean that a diurnal cycle, both rising and uh, sinking rates, they do have access to deep water or the nutrient source. And here's an example of a bloom caught in progress. This is another of the same reservoir in Florida. I call it the exponential yo-yo bloom. So in about the middle of this graph, the hypolimnion went in offset in this reservoir. And that's what was necessary to, uh, to get the, back, the kind of bacteria going. If there's no deep nutrient, it's very difficult for the kind of bacteria to build bloom biomass. And certainly in, a, in drought conditions with no watershed loading, that's what they have to have to grow. And they're, as I said earlier, they typically co-depend on iron and phosphorus. And some blooms in particular, uh, if you've got microcystis, you know that ammonia is being produced. And you've got no other way to get that bloom. So then to summarize all this stuff, you know, in a pictorial form, you know, with a problem of anoxia, drinking water is meant that epilimia, you've got this warm, high dissolved oxygen water being mixed the atmosphere has got algae growing in it, producing oxygen, and the hypolimian is cool and it's cold and stagnant. And it doesn't actually need to be cool and cold, it just needs to be a, a couple of degrees, degrees colder than the epilimian, and that's all the thermal isolation you need. And the dissolved oxygen is defeated by sediments. And so then the anoxia and the hypolimian move nutrients from the sediments to the water, and the nutrients from deep water cause bloom. And there, there are some misconceptions out there that the hypolumian um, may be enriched with nutrients, but it doesn't really communicate much with the surface. And we know that's, um, that's not correct. In fact, there's massive transfer of nutrients from the hypolumian to the surface. And I can show you some good evidence of that. So in terms of fixing the problem, uh, injecting oxygen into the hypolimian in the deepest part is highly successful. There's a lot of these projects in the United States and almost none outside of the United States. It's just a historic accident that that's so. There's about 45 of these projects that I can count in the USA. All of them have been successful. A couple that were have been discontinued, uh, but that they were successful in their day. They discontinued for financial reasons. And, and Jacobs uh, has designed seven of these systems that are now in operation. So we have a, a deep experience in this and of course we're, we're heavily engaged in designing more. And so the uh, the oxygen kills the anoxia and it keeps phosphorus, ammonia, manganese, iron, and the sediments. And it restores habitat. This presentation is is, is really not going to talk about the, uh, the beneficial effect of restoring deep habitat in terms of water quality. Uh, but they're, they're a big deal. There's just no time to really talk about that. The emphasis here is on the <laughs> side of this, but um, it would be interesting to put together a different presentation of the ecological benefits for water quality. And as a consequence of, of denying nutrients for cyanobacteria, and certainly as a consequence of just getting rid of manganese and iron and stuff that you do not want in your raw water, uh, you get a sharp reduction in blooms. So why pure oxygen and not air? I get asked this question a lot. This is a picture of a spent pure oxygen bubble stream at the surface. Uh, the diffusers are at about 15 meters, or 16 meters in this location. You can see it just looks like a spent champagne bubbles in a glass uh, the next morning after a party. There's hardly anything there. And the reason oxygen is better is that there's five times better oxygen transfer than air for the same volume. 
despite a lot of harmful pressures. And this is critical. Oxygen bubbles shrink as they rise. They lose their lift. Now, of course, any bubble is going to be subjected to Boyle's law, so it should expand as it's rising. But because the oxygen is dissolving, you know, almost to the vanishing point in the water, it's shrinking. So uh, if you had a draft tube to the bottom and you injected air, you'd get a nice uh, airless pump. If you inject uh, the same volume of oxygen, you might get nothing because the, the bubbles are uh, diffused into the water before they can rise far enough and they lose momentum. Gravity takes over. As a consequence, there's much lower currents. And this is critical because if there's higher currents on the sediment surface, you start getting the shear of the fusion boundary layer and the express oxygen demand from the sediment is actually higher. And I'll show you a, a kind of a startling result on this later on. And so I would say that aeration is typically uh, a distant second best to oxygenation. I don't think that's true in all instances, but uh, as a default proposition, it, it's true. Uh, of course, there's been tremendous great work done with aeration. It's just that oxygenation has, in the past 10, 15 years, become really uh, rather practical and simple to do, and it's just extremely powerful. So I, I, I sometimes do aeration work, but it's, it's always in a very niche uh, sort of application. Otherwise, it's all about oxygen. So this hypomimetic oxygenation uh, seems to be uh, kind of a mouthful and difficult to say, so I sometimes just call it deep oxygen injection. It's typically run on the upper left-hand side. You can see a liquid oxygen tank with, with, with uh, vaporizers and the arrow is pointing to that the little white dot on the shoreline. Uh, as you saw earlier, these diffusers are manufactured on the reservoir side. Then they are positioned over the deepest part and sunk. Uh, with the, and the oxygen just sparges into the bottom. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple system. If you're using liquid oxygen, once you sink this thing, the whole thing just runs off vaporization pressure of oxygen all the and the power that, that you might wish for is strictly for control for skating. No, there's no pumping. Well, but there is pumping with the alternative technology, which is side stream oxygenation. And so um, let me see, I have basically some questions here. I'll just get through the slide and then turn to questions. Um, the alternative technology is side stream oxygenation. In this technology, there is a fish stream uh, that uh, is water is pumped out of the deepest part. It goes through a downflow oxygen contactor that's getting a uh, pure oxygen stream uh, injected into the surface. It creates a bubble swarm that can only get out by supersaturating. It depends on the pressure and the tone and the temperature, but Typically, it's discharged at about 80 milligrams per liter of uh, dissolved oxygen. And then that water is returned via a ductor array that mix it down into a stable supersaturation uh, and uh, get a lot of oxygen into the uh, reservoir that way. It's really, really a superb technology. And I just want to see if there's any questions. So let's see. Um, Moving on to the next slide. Uh, linear diffuser versus supersaturation. Well, both are equally effective, technically speaking, but linear diffusers are 30 to 50% of the supersaturation cost. So that's a major motivator. Of those 45 projects that I mentioned, 38 are linear diffusers and seven are, are uh, deep currents. But supersaturation is the only appropriate technology for shallow water, which immediately begs the question, so what is shallow? Sparging has successfully been used as shallow as eight meters. We tend to get pushed a little bit out of our comfort zone because of lower cost of uh, linear diffusers, uh, because it can be stratified a water. And these particular instances, the stratification of a water with pure oxygen is not a problem. It does does the same job geochemically, no problem. But uh, these are recent projects, and sooner or later, we're going to come up on one where we just 
feed to go in shallower. And also, if there's intermittent stratification in a shallow reservoir, you really need to start thinking about a steep cone, probably the best way to go. We actually had used a steep cone in a treatment wetland with a water depth of 25 centimeters. So you've got this very shallow water body that's hyperutrophic. In this case, it needed to nitrify a lot of water with the treatment system. And we were able, with a steep cone, recirculating water, supersaturated water, to keep the dissolved oxygen above saturation in this shallow water. So there's really no, it, there's nothing, there's no such thing as it being too shallow for a steep cone. It's a remarkable technology. Love to use it. So let's look at some case studies. Let me see. Uh, and uh, Tomo, if you're listening, and see, I'm not sure. Um, I can't see any questions. Perhaps we'll wait for the end. So, looking at case studies, first we'll look at St. Paul Regional Water Services in Minnesota, in the USA. And then Aurora Water in Colorado. And then Lake Bowen and Spartanburg Water, Spartanburg County, South Carolina. And most of the technical information will be in the St. Paul Regional Water Services because it's a massive data set that really gives us some insight. And then the Aurora Water and Lake Bowen are sort of the, the supporting data. Well, really, as I uh, probably intimated more than once here, we're talking about nutrient denial strategies with uh, hypomimetic oxygen. Oxygenation, excuse me. Uh, this project it has many phases, but there's no time to get into detail with all of them by any means. What St. Paul Regional Water Services does is pump Mississippi with the water about 200 megaliters per day into a chain of natural lakes that condition the water. This has been done since the early 20th century. And then finally, to Badness Lake, which is uh, where it's pumped uh, the plant. So, and there's also ferric iron injection. Ferric iron injection at the Mississippi River pump station, into the local creek, and into Badness Lake as well. So Pleasant Lake and Badness Lake both have had hypolimitic aeration systems and uh, ultimately which were replaced by hypolimitic oxygenation systems. And so what is what were these aeration systems? They were partial lift submerged hypolimitic aeration. It's just a big draft tube, and so the air is vented out of the top, which is a fully submerged, <clears throat> and then the water comes out port from the side. It preserves thermal stratification quite nicely. It's partially effective, and you'll see that as we move on, but it doesn't do so much turbulence. We can't recommend this technology. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's a dead technology. We, we've done the forensics on four of these systems, all of them. You know, partial failures, partial successes, and we understand exactly why they, they didn't work as well as they did. But they did do some good, as you'll see. So, looking at Badness Lake, at hypolimitic dissolved oxygen in June through August, which is the crunch time. This is a time where uh, it's, it's very strongly anoxic. I took all of the hypolimitic oxygen values of the meter. And six to 14 meters in depth. Six meters is where the therm, bottom of the thermal climb. So there's a little bit, little bit of oxygen at the bottom of the thermal climb, and I decided not to cherry pick these things, just wanted to throw them all in. Um, the uh, oxygen transfer rating of these uh, uh, aeration devices is about 1,200 kilograms per day, and the pure oxygen uh, transfer average is about 800 kilograms per day. So if we look on the left-hand side, we see that there's low oxygen or anoxia at the, in the hypolimitic aeration. There was a summer where we had the, uh, we had nothing. It was just had to be uh, the aerators had to be demoed before we could put in the oxygen, and then with the oxygen, and you can see in the first year there's some oxygen debt that was required. Uh, oxygen supply was perhaps overdone. <laughs> It got super saturated, and then finally uh, achieved a sort of an operational um, uh, you know, sweet point for, for oxygenation. So that's averaging 800 kilograms per day. So we're getting more dissolved oxygen with less oxygen injection, which would seem to be a contradiction, but it's not because the currents induced by the oxygen are, are negligible across the sediment surface.
where is this particular racing device induced a rather strong current at the set of the surface, and therein lies the difference. So if we look at Pleasant Lake, the first one in the series, this is the one that gets water directly from the Mississippi. Uh, it's hypolimitic dissolved oxygen. We have uh, uh, air on the left-hand side, and it actually did fairly well, better than Pleasant Lake, curiously enough. Then an air connection uh, uh, air hose became disconnected, and the diver died trying to fix it, so they decided to leave the system dead. Uh, so there are several years where there's nothing going on in Pleasant Lake. And then we installed the oxygenation system, and you can see there's really quite a marked difference between the two. And if we look at hypomimetic redox in millivolts, you can see for the three years where we had this monitoring with nothing and some very low redox values, and then with the oxygen, the redox values are rather high, which means that it's full of oxidizing materials. And then in Badness Lake, hypomimetic redox, again, just, just one year with Badness Lake with redox monitoring. Then the year of nothing, we see the bottom starting to drop out of the redox. And then with oxygen. So these hypolimitic aeration systems did a pretty good job with redox. That is, they kept most of the iron oxidized um, and most of the manganese oxidized, but not quite enough to um, uh, be as good as they were intended to be. So looking at that, it's like hypolimitic total phosphorus. You see the baseline period in the gray on the left, tremendously high total phosphorus numbers in the hypolimitic. But with aeration plus ferric injection, a, a, really, a dramatic drop, it did a really good job. Not good enough, but it did a really good job. And the oxygenation plus ferric did get an even better job, a significantly better job, statistically. And you'll see the effect of that in a moment. Uh, looking at total iron, we start to see um, the effects of oxygen compared to air. So on the left-hand side, baseline, uh, in the middle of the vertical stripes, aeration plus ferric, and there's yet more iron because, not surprisingly, there's iron injection. But there's still iron injection on the right-hand side, the oxygen box in the white, uh, same amount of iron, but there's greater oxidizing power so that iron is uh, mostly insoluble. So there was a, a, a lot of solubilization of iron with the aeration system. And then uh, a bit of a sleeper is the manganese. The manganese, uh, there was enough manganese to really exert a tremendous oxygen demand. And on the left hand side, we can see the baseline condition with nothing in Badness Lake, but on the vertical, in the middle there with the vertical lines, the aeration plus there, it really oxidized a lot of manganese, but it left a lot of manganese yet unoxidized. And so with oxygenation, it pretty much took care of the manganese. These are, these are total manganese. We probably shouldn't give you a bunch of numbers, but um, uh, I, I don't think the clients have filtered data. So that's, but in terms of total manganese, the oxygen is simply much, much better than, than aeration. So it's got higher oxidizing power. Well, if we look at surface total phosphorus, these uh, probability plots, uh, your uh, the percentiles are on the bottom, total phosphorus, notice the long scale of the vertical axis. That red line is at 40 micrograms per liter, which in the United States is a critical number. Above 40 micrograms per liter, a lake is eutrophic. Below it, it's metrotrophic. It's a different uh, regulatory category altogether. So we pay attention to that number. So if we look at the distribution of surface total phosphorus <clears throat> in the baseline condition, uh, there's, there's a lot. And that's, that is simply because of all of the phosphorus in the hypolimbian that is being trained and transferred to the, to the epilimbian. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, when, you, when you look at these, when you look at these, uh, the thermal profiles in detail, you can see why this occurs because there's really quite a bit of mixing with the thermal profiles. But when you look at aeration, in the squares, the next line down, well, aeration did a pretty good job because it knocked down a lot of phosphorus in the hypolimbian. But oxygen did a, a yet better job, and it turns out that yet better 
is not just the read it, it actually makes a big difference in the system, as you'll see in a bit. So let's look at chlorophyll, chlorophyll A in Badman's Lake. Now, you can see from baseline aeration, oxygenation, these lines are rather on top of each other. Um, they're all, they, they share the same 60th percentile or thereabouts. But if you look at the upper quartile, there's a huge difference. And that difference is blooms. So with oxygenation, the blooms are not there. The, the cytobacteria are all there. They're, they're trying to ramp up their blooms. They're often in sort of pre-bloom conditions, or, 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 or cell counts, rather. But they can't get to a bloom themselves because they can't get the iron, they can't get the phosphorus. It's a, you know, it's a mass limitation. So this is this is a critical difference. Central tendencies might not change. They can, as you'll see shortly. Central tendencies can change enormously with oxygenation, but it's that upper quartile that may be the most interesting part. And oh dear, that uh, the slide just went bad on us, and I can't do anything about it. Um, okay, well, uh, the uh, the same story for seven minutes. The, the, the iron was not uh, noticed here. I'm not sure what happened to it, but we'll move on. And let's see here. And um, that slide went bad as well. Hmm, I'm sorry. Okay, well, let's look at the uh, Pleasant Lake uh, surface total phosphorus. We're just showing that it's pretty much the same pattern that we saw in the earlier slides with manganese and iron happening in Pleasant Lake. A uh, bit of a technical glitch. But looking at present surface total phosphorus, we see the, in the blue dots, that's the oxygenation, and there's all the other project phases above it. The highest line is the baseline. But we can see that the surface total phosphorus is lowest with the oxygenation. And in Pleasant Lake, we get an even more dramatic improvement in chlorophyll A than we saw in Pleasant Lake. So certainly, if we look at the, the green and blue, that's the oxygenation, the median was lowered substantially. There's differences between lakes. They express they they have different personalities, different dynamics to the work. And, but you can see that uh, it's not only the median that's been reduced, but the peaks have been chopped out. Actually, the way these graphs work. If they're distributed uh, in a linear fashion on these graphs, it means there's a normal distribution. And if it's distributed like in dog legs or hockey sticks, whichever way you want to describe those curves, you actually have different statistical populations, which means that uh, from the dynamics of algae in these lakes, when you get these, these, these dog leg curves, it means there's a shift in the dynamics of the lake. If the lake has a, uh, a, a, you know, a, it's a different system. Uh, when you've got a bloom in terms of the dynamics of chlorophyll A. But with oxygenation, it's just one system, one statistical population. So the shifts over to uh, a bloom state is going to occur. So here's a rural reservoir in Colorado. What a different reservoir, much cleaner water. Uh, you wouldn't think much of scuba diving in, in uh, certain lake or bad mistakes, but this is a scuba diving center. It, yet it has an anoxic hypolimnion. It has a high iron manganese, it had rather, it doesn't have any anymore, but it, it had an anoxic hypolimnion, even with a hypolimnic aeration system. High iron manganese, uh, ammonia in the hypolimnion, excess algae to surface, hypolimnic oxygenation started up in July of 2016. And we can see in Aurora Reservoir uh, prior to, uh, to uh, 2016, the hypolimnion was anoxic, despite the fact that it had, had hypolimnic aeration. And then to the right, after oxygenation started, there's no difference between surface and bottom. And there's a 90% reduction in case motor complaints. And it was a three year uh, return on investment. It's about a million dollar cost looking at net chemical and GAC savings. So this is, this is a great success story. And yet we have to always look in detail at what's going on here because there's more interesting things that we, should, we need to know about. So here's a vertical profiler 
Uh, you know, getting data every two hours up and down. Um, you get dissolved oxygen in the lower reservoir. And you see the bottom is highly anoxic. I, I mean, it is highly aerobic. Rather, it's, it's saturated dissolved oxygen. And so that's working fine. But we see at the thermal plane as algae settle on a density gradient, they perch on top of the thermal plane. This is a rather isolated region. And there's an oxygen sag. It gets, you know, kind of anoxic in some bits there. And actually, those algae die. Uh, and as they die, they, you know, they exert an oxygen demand. And those nutrients are released from algae. So there is the potential if there was some other nutrient input, like a pulse from a fire, for instance, that this, uh, even with oxygenation, that the thermal chlorine could become fully anoxic and could become a problem. We haven't seen that yet, but we have seen data like this, and we, we understand there's design responses to it, and uh, we're aware of that. So I think everyone in, in the business who does this uh, you know, knows that this is something that should be considered in design. There are design responses. And looking at these results, so the hypolimnia is also over 50% saturation. Uh, the problems of uh, metal uh, solubilization and excess algae were eliminated. But yet at the same time, we do see the algae, although the previous problems with algae existed, we see the numbers of algae that have perched at, this, at, at the end of the summer, they're perched in like a pre-bloom condition. So some other stimulus could, could uh, allow an algae bloom to occur. And it's been a 95% reduction in case of odor, and again, I guess it's a bit redundant, and then it's about half a million a year in cost for chemicals for a one million construction. So let's look at uh, Lake Bowen Reservoir in Spartanburg County, South Carolina. Now, this reservoir presented special difficulties. It's long, skinny, and it's very shallow, except at the dam front. So at the dam front, we put in we put in oxygen here to look at oxygen tank, um, and that took care of the problems, some very distinct problems with metal solubilization at the dam front. But you can see in the yellow line that's as far back as we can go with the linear diffusers, and just to be going back a little bit more is where the hypolimnion is. But for 80%, 75% or so of this reservoir, there's no hypolimnion to speak of. And yet, there are problems of the nutrient release from shallow sediment that have to be tended to. So what we did is we inject uh, aluminum chlorohydrate in the narrow to uh, have uh, air bubble plumes put in some short diffusion sections and instead of putting oxygen to them, uh, have hooked up a compressor and put in air and then injected a soluble dose of aluminum chlorohydrate. These are very, very low doses. We had kept them below the US EPA criteria for chronic toxicity. And, and so, so this is an integrated system. We had to take care of the shallows as well in conjunction with, uh, with oxygenation. And you can see, looking at the shallower stations here, uh, putting, uh, looking at total phosphorus, putting in the aluminum chlorohydrate uh, was a critical improvement to uh, the total phosphorus in these shallow sampling stations. They're not influenced by the uh, by the hypolimnetic oxygenation in the two part stream. But at the dam front, you can see on the left hand side, this is an isoplex. Uh, the red, you can see that's the you know, that's highly anoxic condition. And the noxia really is reaching up towards the surface, which is one of the problems. This is before oxygenation. And then on the right hand side with oxygenation, it um, well, well there's no problem with 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 the ball box and there's plenty of it. And downstream, I didn't mention this because we have another reservoir downstream, poetic removed reservoir number one. And on the left hand side, there's strong anoxia in pre-oxygenation. And then with uh, with oxygenation, uh, we've taken care of the anoxia. I think there's a little bit more work to be done to get it up to saturation. There's uh, decades of oxygen debt that needs to be repaid. But it's behaving itself nicely. And 
And as you can see in the manganese and the iron results, on the left hand side, we'd be uh, looking at the hypolimnion uh, in Lake Bowen. You can see that with the installation in uh, the beginning of operation in 2016 of the hypolimnic oxygenation, both iron and manganese are brought down dramatically. That's a long scale on the left. And the same story is true for uh, reservoir number one on the right. So we're looking at taking care of several things at once from a, just a raw water quality. We just got to knock out the iron and the manganese. And then in terms of controlling the algae, got to knock down the phosphorus. But it's all part of one big system. So the nutrient control, control looking at our you know, case study conclusion, the pure um, hypomimetic oxygenation quenches internal nutrient loading. Unlike, uh, unlike air, which partially quenches it, oxygenation almost entirely quenches it. It quenches the iron, the manganese, it lowers the surface total phosphorus because of this um, you know, poorly recognized exchange of nutrients between the hypolimnion and, and the epilimnion. It reduces chlorophyll A. It may reduce the median, but really perhaps the most important part is it chops out the peaks. That is to say, the upper quartile chlorophyll A is much lower under these circumstances with the uh, hypomimetic oxygenation. And overall conclusions are, um, you know, I like to think of reservoirs as being a process number one. It's a way to condition. Uh, you want to condition that, that raw water quality because, you know, having the best possible source water is the oldest idea in drinking water supply. And this is just taking that old idea and, and giving it some, some new life with, with oxygenation, and of course, people have been doing aeration for a century, so it's you know, a lot of people have been working on this. And by an a, you know, interesting chain of historic accidents in the United States, we really got launched on hypomimetic oxygenation. And reservoirs are, you know, they're complex systems, the, the science is difficult to master, but by taking out anoxia, you're taking out a keystone forcing function, if you say in ecology, that are that's driving for raw water quality. So there's still a lot going on. It's not a magic bullet, but oxygenation takes care of, of a lot of ills. And with that, uh, open it up to uh, to questions. Hey, um, just just um, if you can hear me, um, just everyone, um, we're going to have take questions through the um, the little chat box. So if you want to ask your questions through there, um, we'll pass them on to David, and um, he'll answer as many as he can before the time's up. And hopefully, he can um, if he doesn't get enough time, we can uh, get the answers back to you via some other means another time. And then let's see. I'm trying to see how I can see the questions. So, what are the questions going to be sent to me? David, just look at the, the little tab that says number three down the bottom in the screen. A few questions. Okay, number three. And I'm not seeing any questions in number three. Um, oh, okay. I've got a question here. Um, any thoughts about um, locks versus PSAs and O2 source? Well, yeah, because relative costs may differ in Australia. That's, that's a great question because um, we typically. Um, Thus far, our systems have been where lock was you know, plentiful and cheap. That's not always true, of course. So you may want to generate it on site. PSA, uh, uh, pressure swing adsorption systems, um, it's a commodity uh, product. You can get them in pretty much any size. And the alternative to PSA are vacuum swing adsorption systems, which typically have lower operating costs, but you do need a scroll compressor. Um, on the delivery end to, to deliver the pressures because um, you need for, for late 
the Red Fork, we haven't uh, been pushed into doing these yet. We see that the economic benefit for these really start at about 10 tons of oxygen per day, looking at big systems. Uh, the biggest system we designed is about 32 tons a day of oxygen. And that client gave a firm no to uh, PSA or PSA. We asked them why. And they said, well, it's just because we don't want to deal with um, uh, pressure going down. So, you know, we know it's more expensive, but it's operationally simple. So there's a, there's a bunch of factors in there to, to make that decision. But I do know people who have them small ESA or PSA. And that was from Brad. Um, and let's see if I can find. I can't. I can't find any other questions. That was a chat that Brad opened up. Can, Charlie, can you see any other questions? Yeah, I can. I can read a couple out to you. Um, let's see. Yeah, just read them up. Read them up for me, if you would be. First one we have is. This is not, uh, they look like they're all from Brad. Um, <laughs> how do you know this isn't just non-photochemical quenching? I don't know what that refers to exactly. Um, non-photo. You know, I don't. I'm not sure I understand the question. Right. Um, that's right. The yeah, the the light light penetration, the the hypolimium is far beyond the photo zone. Perhaps I haven't understood the question. Um, um, once, how do you select the dose of oxygen to be applied and what monitoring is required? Oh, pardon me, could you repeat that question? How do you select the dose of oxygen to be applied and what kind of monitoring is required? Ah, uh, yes. All right. So um, the, we, we determine the dose of oxygen uh, via two methods. Um, if, if we have good oxygen depletion curve, we have good data over several years that's showing um, uh, the transition from an aerobic hypolimium to an anoxic hypolimium, there's a linear leg of that curve. So if we have a, a, a bunch of points, you know, uh, three or four, <laughs> we look at that. And we go from year to year, and we can see that we can do well. We can, on off the slope of that curve, get our oxygen depletion rate, and then we take that uh, over the area of the hypolimium. So we do uh, we do uh, need the, uh, the symmetry. Uh, alternatively, we can plonk some uh, isolation chambers on the bottom, and those are are highly accurate. We can get the uh, depletion curve in the isolation chambers. Uh, either method is fine, but you just to use one of them. Basically, the method, you know, the design is based on grams of oxygen per square meter per day, uh, then over the hypolimium. Approximately 90% of the oxygen depletion rate in most reservoirs, uh, it's a really deep one, it's a bit different, but about 90% of the oxygen demand overall in the hypolimium comes from the set of an oxygen demand. So we can just run it that way. If we've got chambers, we can also assess you know, water column demand, um, so that that becomes uh, uh, that becomes a sometimes an interesting number to work with. The diffusion themselves, the, the beauty of the linear diffusion systems is that they tend to have almost 100% uh, dial up capacity. Um, you can keep putting air into them until the until the uh, velocity across the orifice is just supersonic. So that's typically somewhere near 100%. And, and it, that allows a certain amount, it allows us to live with a little bit of uncertainty. So we've got a knob we can turn it up and down. The piece cones, however, have a set maximum rate. So you've got to uh, put a bit more work into making sure you uh, have a high degree of certainty with that number. Um, Thanks for that. We might have to actually wrap that wrap it up now. Um, there's a bunch of other questions, but we'll we'll um, maybe try and get the answers back to the the relevant people um, 
offline. Um, we've actually got a, a survey attached as well. I'm not um, it'd be great if um, everyone who's dialed in today would be able to um, just quickly do this survey before they log off. And yeah, thanks again, everyone, for for joining in. I hope it was interesting. And um, if you do still have questions, just hurry up and put them in the box, and we'll we'll try and get back to you um, as soon as we can. So yeah, that's all. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone.